Sergey, welcome back to Real Vision. Thank you for having me again. It's a pleasure to have you here always. Uh, you've been on Real Vision a number of times. We've talked through Chainlink. We're here to talk today about Chainlink 2.0. But before we get into that, let's do a quick review uh, for people who may not have seen our earlier conversations. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what Chainlink is, about hybrid smart contracts, and about oracles. Give us a working definition of what those terms are why they're significant, and why they feature prominently in the Chainlink platform. Sure. So, so hybrid smart contracts are the more advanced version of smart contracts that are able to interface and affect um, the real world in terms of outside systems, outside data, outside payments. And when I say outside, I mean outside of a blockchain. So if smart contracts started out as a way to make tokens, because that was kind of the fundamental feature they had in order to pay miners, and then folks figured out how to make voting schemes in the form of DAOs on top of those tokens, right? So the initial two features of blockchains were really tokenization, which was great for bringing in a lot of value into the industry, and then DAO voting, which was great for creating some kind of governance um, or collective decision-making structure um, often around those tokens. The next stage is all of that, as well as connectivity to external systems, right? And even though smart contracts are called smart, they are actually unable to speak with external data or affect things in the world outside of a blockchain. And so what a hybrid smart contract is, is the more advanced realization of a smart contract in that it can not only be about tokens or voting, but it can actually be about insurance policies uh, in the real world about weather or market events with derivatives or lending protocols in relation to market data or any number of other use cases that really have to be built in a hybrid smart contract form. And the hybrid smart contract um, format really has two equal parts to it. It has the smart contract code itself that lives on chain in various blockchains. And then there is the Oracle, right? And the Oracle is the basically decentralized consensus method and system that guarantees inputs into the contract code, right? So when you're doing smart contracts, when you're making them, you're basically trying to achieve hyper-reliable automation. You're basically trying to go from a world of probabilistic, um, just trust me promises, to a world of cryptographically guaranteed outcomes that are going to happen under all circumstances. And all circumstances means whatever, you know, the economy decides or whatever governments decide or whatever your counterparty decides, those, those outcomes will still happen in a cryptographically guaranteed way. And so smart contract code guarantees that to the degree that the on-chain state is, is going to change in a certain predictable way. But then you also have to guarantee what controls that state right, what controls the change on chain. And that is what oracles and oracle networks um, and decentralized oracle networks do, is they provide a level of consensus and validation and essentially a, a form of trust minimized off-chain computation that guarantees that the on-chain code will actually be triggered correctly. Because if it's triggered incorrectly, then it largely loses its value, right? You, you don't want a highly reliable piece of code that's very easy to manipulate through an external system. You actually want end-to-end -end security that guarantees you highly deterministic, hyper-reliable outcomes in this smart contract format. And for that, in relation to external systems, in relation to weather events for insurance or market data for derivatives or you know, delivery-related events for global trade, you need connectivity with external systems, but you need that connectivity to be guaranteed in a highly reliable way both in terms of it consistently being live, so giving you liveness, and in terms of accuracy, so making sure that the triggering event for the outcome on chain is properly validated. Sergey, for people uh, who may not have the technical background, let's walk through a couple of examples, a couple of case studies uh, mm -hmm. to explain precisely the points you just made with real world examples. Sure. So, so there's really you know two or three categories. One category is DeFi. DeFi is decentralized financial products, which basically means the types of financial products you're used to, except they run on a blockchain. So how those are composed 
is that there's a piece of code on a blockchain that guarantees that that financial product will have to pay you interest at a certain rate, as long as the market data about the value of the thing that the lending product is about is accurate, right? So you have a guarantee that you will receive a certain um, rate of return, and the only other factor going into that is the actual market value of, of the thing that, that is in the lending protocol. And that's where you need an Oracle mechanism, which validates the data about the value of the thing in the decentralized financial product. That's, that's one example. An, another example, which is, which is now kind of taking form, is, uh, and, and one that I'm very interested in, is, is the centralized crop insurance. So, so this is the ability to monitor the, wor the world's weather events through the many different data sources that prove what the weather is and pay out an insurance policy to anybody anywhere on the planet that has an internet connection, regardless of an insurance company, right? So you can basically codify um, a farmer's relationship to risk in the form of an on-chain insurance contract. And then you need a system that's gonna reliably prove that the weather events um, that the insurance contract is about actually happened or didn't happen. And that's where Oracle networks come in is they validate and prove that there was actually a drought or there was actually a storm or there was actually a heat wave. And then they allowed that proof to trigger the, the outcomes defined in the contract, right? So you need the contract to be highly reliable and secure, which is what blockchains do. And then you need the proof and the triggers and all the systems that control that to be highly reliable in what they do. And, and that's the role that Oracle networks play. Sergey, let me, let me just jump in here because I think this is such an important point. I've always thought that the crop insurance metaphor uh, or use case is a really good one for understanding smart contracts and oracles. So you could imagine a system uh, where a farmer, uh, whether it's in uh, Zimbabwe or Indiana, has a particular insurance contract uh, with an insurance company uh, that basically reads if there is more than you know five inches of rain in a 12-hour period, they get flood insurance compensation. Now, under the current model, you have an insurance company, you have the person who takes out the policy, uh, and then you have to kind of prove to the insurance company that, that this event did happen. In the smart contract world, this all takes place in a sort of in, on chain uh, in a way that becomes irrevocable, immutable, so that neither party uh, can either decide not to pay a premium or decide not to pay out a claim once something is validated. Now, the key point of this and where oracles are so significant is that there is third-party data in the form of, for example, NOAA weather satellite data, uh, National Weather Service logs, all of these things that are created by third parties. And so the question becomes, how do you tie together the smart contract and the information from the outside world? And so crop insurance in many ways, I think DeFi is often a little bit abstract for people, particularly if they're not in the space, but crop insurance is something that feels very concrete. Uh, it's something that people can get their head around. And I think it's such an interesting use case uh, for Chainlink, for other oracles and for the smart contract space. Yeah, I, th I, th I, think, I think it's a very meaningful use case because it, it, it interestingly enough, has, has a few properties that usually aren't in blockchain world. So the first thing, one is it doesn't have anything to do with tokens, right? It doesn't have anything to do with the value of a token rising or falling or changing or anything like that. Secondly, it, it actually helps people manage um, business-related risk, which is why a lot of financial products were actually invented. Many futures contracts, many financial products weren't invented for speculative reasons. They were invented so that business owners could manage away risk and continue to operate their business even if there was a drought, even if there was too much rain or not enough rain or any number of other factors. And then the third thing that I think is, is fascinating is that there are already great, great teams and companies like Arbol and others that are already doing this, right? So we already have decentralized crop insurance being built which I think is only gonna become more, more and more relevant with the extreme weather events that are happening now due to various you know, climate change results and, and, and various other you know, exogenous factors kind of. So I, I, I think that this proves that blockchains and smart contracts, when combined with external data in the form of a hybrid smart contract, can do much more than tokenization. They can do much more than, than act as a speculative instrument for somebody. Um, which is fine and, you know, has brought a lot of, you know, 
value into our industry, but I think it's time for our industry to go beyond that. And then the second thing that I think is quite impactful is that anybody with an internet connection, as you mentioned in Zimbabwe or Indiana or anywhere, can actually interface with this agreement without relying on an insurance company. And so the fascinating thing is that historically, the way that you would decide who you want to do an agreement with would be based on a brand. And there would be a very nice logo. And the logo would say, hey, I've been around for over 100 years. You should trust me in regards to um, you know this type of contract, and that's fine, and that works very that works very well, and it's worked very well for hundreds of years. But we're now actually moving to a world where there's a piece of code in a irrevocable, immutable, ungameable system that doesn't need a brand attached to it because the code guarantees certain outcomes to you regardless of of even how you access the code, right? And so you could access the code through any number of different interfaces or applications um, from your phone or from your computer, and you'd fundamentally be accessing the same risk management system, the same code as hundreds of thousands or millions of other people or farmers or or users of that of that risk management um, code. And so, that's um, that's the other, you know, I think truly fascinating thing is that any, yeah. anybody with an internet connection can now get crop insurance regardless of their local legal system and regardless of, you know, their trust or faith in an insurance company. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com forward slash crypto. It's 100% free. Sign up now.